Good afternoon, or evening, or morning, depending on what time you're watching this video is. Um, I'm Dr. Philip Tremovich, and I am going to be giving to you, or we're, we're going to be presenting here, a number of videos that have been designed to teach a little bit about writing scientific reports, in particular, writing about laboratory reports, or writing of laboratory reports. So if you're taking the Academic English for Science class, um, hopefully this will be a good review for you and help you follow the material that's in the lectures. Um, if you're thinking about taking that class or a class like it, this can give you a little insight into what the class might be about. Um, and if you don't have time to take a class on writing academic reports, but you have to write some, you're taking a chemistry class or a physics class, and you're doing experiments, and you're asked to write a laboratory report, what should you do? Um, hopefully, if you watch these videos, it will give you a basic idea of things you should think about and ways you should design those reports so that they will meet the common expectations that professors have or that scientists have for how we present information in science. So there'll be a number of videos. Um, in this first video, I'll be talking about the basic structure of scientific reports and laboratory reports. And I'll also then go into talking about paragraphs and a little bit about sentences, so basic writing issues. So let's get started. So in this video, as I said, I'll be talking about basic structure of a scientific report, as well as the structure and design of paragraphs. So the structure of a scientific report. Um, basically, scientific reports should follow a very specific way of arranging the information. Um, these methods have been developed over probably the last 100 years and have been pretty much fixed for at least half a century. And it doesn't matter if you're writing in Japanese or if you're writing in English or if you're writing in French or in Spanish. The approach is almost always the same across science. First, there's a title. Okay, that's probably not a surprise. Um, after that, it depends on if you're writing a large report or a small report. Um, usually, if it's a very small report, like a laboratory report for a class in college, you do not need to have what's known as an abstract. An abstract is basically a one-paragraph summary of the information in the report. Because laboratory reports tend to be short, two, three, four, maybe five pages, there's not so much need for a summary. Um, but if you're writing an actual scientific article, something to be published in a journal, it's probably going to be 5, 15, maybe 25 pages long, in which case the summary is critical and required. So depending on what situation you're in, you might want to write an abstract, or you might not want to, or you might be required to, or required not to. Um, so you'll need to check. But usually for a laboratory report, you do not need the abstract. After that, it's all pretty standard. So the first part of a scientific report is the introduction. Okay, probably not a surprise. Um, a good laboratory report, a good scientific article, most of the introduction is actually a literature review. So it reviews what's been found before in that field or related to that field or the topic of your report. Then would come a new section known as either materials or materials and methods, um, sometimes just called method. Um, the materials and methods section, um, this presents what you did. So you did some research, you did an experiment, and you're writing up a report on this. Well, what exactly did you do? The reader needs to know in order to understand what it is that they're reading. That goes in the materials and methods section, not in the introduction. So notice that there's a very clear arrangement of information. After the materials and methods section is the results section. Sometimes people call it the findings. So you did this research or this experiment, you probably measured things, you counted things, you tabulated things, you collected data and did some analysis of it. Well, what were the results of that analysis? So that goes in the results section. It does not go in the method section. It does not go in the introduction. It goes in the results section. Okay? Now the results section is supposed to be completely objective. You measured this, here's the finding. Okay, maybe it's all math, maybe it's all numbers and graphs, whatever it is. After the results section comes another section, the fourth section of the body of your writing. And that's called usually the discussion. Some people call it the conclusion. Um, a few people call it comments. Um, but usually it's called discussion. And this section is where you explain to your reader what does it mean. 
So you've told them the background in the introduction. You've told them what you did in your materials and methods section. You told them what you actually found and measured in your results section. But what does it mean? <laughs> okay, what do these numbers mean? In words, what does it mean that goes in the discussion section? Now, as you're doing all this writing, particularly as you're doing the introduction, if you're doing it really well, you're probably talking about other people's research as well. So Tanaka in 1988 published an article using the same method that you used. Well, you might talk about that in your introduction. Somebody else, you know, Suzuki in 1993, maybe did a similar um, type of research or experiment using a slightly different method than you're using. But the same basic idea, trying to get at the same possible answer to learn the same thing. That should be talked about in your introduction. Well, when you mention other people's work, you have to provide your reader with a list of references, and that's known as a reference list. So either references or reference list, and this lists all the detailed information so a reader can go find those other reports. So it would have things like the title of the report, the names of the authors, the name of the journal it was published in, what page numbers it was on, um, that type of information. Um, so that all goes in your reference list. Now, you don't usually need anything more than this, but if you have some other stuff that you want to include and it doesn't really fit in any of the above sections, then you put it in what's called an appendix, the plural appendices. So some reports will have appendices at the back, um, but usually we don't have appendices. So this is the basic structure of a scientific report. This could be a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation. This could be an article a scientist is trying to publish in a peer-reviewed international journal. Or this could be you're taking a chemistry class, so you did an experiment last Friday and you need to write a two-page two report and submit it to your professor this coming Friday. So in all cases, it comes down to this structure. So you're writing. That means you're writing paragraphs. At least hopefully it means you're writing paragraphs. So what is a paragraph? Now hopefully you were taught this long ago and you already know, um, but based on some things I've heard from other professors, it seems that many people do not really have a clear idea of what a paragraph is. A paragraph is a group of sentences that present information on one topic, and that's the key, one topic, a single topic. If your topic is very, very big and has lots of subtopics, that's fine. A paragraph can be on one subtopic, but it's on one idea, one topic, one subtopic, or just one, just one. Not three different things in the same paragraph. If you have three different things to talk about, you've got three different paragraphs, at least three different paragraphs. So it's a group of sentences, all on one topic, and they're arranged and organized to present that information to your reader. And don't forget about that. The goal of writing is to create a document that somebody else will read, not you. <laughs> somebody else, not even your professor in the case of a laboratory report. Somebody else will pick this up and read this at some point in the future. They need to be able to understand what it is you're writing. So when you write your paragraphs, when you design your paragraphs, you need to stay focused on each paragraph on one idea and give support for it. Don't just say something such and such is true. Why is it true? How do you know it's true? Why do you believe it's true? What's the evidence that suggests that is true? Doesn't matter what it is, you need support for whatever that topic, that idea is. Now, everything I've just said pretty much applies to almost any human language. It applies to writing in Japanese. It applies to writing in English. French, Spanish, doesn't matter. It applies to all of them. So although you can structurally create a paragraph that is technically a paragraph, it's formatted properly, it's made up of sentences, the grammar is fine, um, it won't be a good paragraph if you do not follow this approach. So good paragraphs, good writing, requires that you think and design each paragraph carefully. Okay? And again, doesn't matter what language you're working in. So, what is the general structure? Well, I've sort of pretty much given away what the structure is already, but to make it very explicit, a paragraph should have a logical structure. When somebody reads the paragraph, they should, if not absolutely agree with you by the end of the paragraph, they should at least know why you believe what you wrote. 
That means there needs to be information there and it needs to be presented in a way that makes it easy for the reader to understand. That is critical. Always remember, you're writing for somebody else to read. So, where should you start? You should start with a topic sentence. In almost all cases, in almost all languages, the first sentence of the paragraph should be a topic sentence. After you've oriented your reader, so they now know the general direction you're heading in, they might not know specifically where you're going, but generally they've got an idea what you're going to talk about, what you're going to present, then you present the supporting information, the supporting details, the examples, the facts, the measurements, the arguments, whatever it is, but you provide that supporting information. And ha having oriented the reader with the topic sentence and then giving the support, you then, as usually the last sentence of the paragraph, provide a concluding sentence. So draw it all together. Draw the conclusion from the information you gave and arguments you gave on the topic you oriented your reader to with your first sentence. So that's the general structure for a good paragraph. Do this in any language where you are writing. Let's take a look at the different parts. So the first part I mentioned is topic sentence. So what does a topic sentence do? Well, I've already told you this. It tells the reader the main idea of the paragraph. The goal is to orient your reader. Which, which direction are you going to be going? It does not need to be overly precise. In fact, it probably should not be too precise. Um, but it's just give the reader a general direction. Where are you heading with that paragraph? Where should you put the topic sentence? Well, almost always, the very first sentence of the paragraph should be the topic sentence. It's not a rule. You don't have to do this. It's a guideline. But I strongly urge you to follow this guideline. The best writing almost always has every paragraph, or nearly er every paragraph, has a topic sentence as the first sentence, not the second sentence, the first sentence. It's a better writing style. It makes it much easier for the readers to understand what it is you're going to be talking about before you start talking about it. As I already mentioned, it should contain exactly one idea. Not two, not three, not four. One. If you mention two different things in your topic sentence, then your reader's not quite sure which direction you're going in. And they'll probably figure it out as they read your supporting information and your conclusion. But in order to make it easy for your reader, you don't want them wondering, oh, what, what is it? What is it that I'm, I'm being told about? What am I being taught about? You don't want them questioning while they're reading. They should be told, this is the direction I'm going, <laughs> and here's the information you need to know about that. So, for the topic sentence, one and only one idea. So, how do you go about writing it? Well, it takes a little bit of practice, but just think about what is your main idea? Why are you presenting the paragraph? What's the purpose of the paragraph? So, you're trying to present something, okay? What's that something? <laughs> so, think about what's your main idea and then maybe write a sentence that sort of summarizes that idea. But do not write it like a conclusion. The conclusion comes after you have the support, the facts, the findings, and so on. But this is a topic sentence. This is just to orient your reader. So think of it as sort of like a summary of the main idea, but not written as a conclusion. Okay? So first part is the topic sentence, usually for a paragraph, for a good paragraph. After that comes the supporting sentences. So what do they do? Well, they support the idea of the paragraph. So what goes there? Well, almost anything could go there. It could be examples. It could be facts. It could be findings. It could be arguments or explanations of reasoning. It could be any number of things. But this topic sentence gives the focus, and then comes the information. So this is the bulk of the paragraph. Will it be one sentence or ten sentences? Could be either or something in between. One, kind of short. Ten, probably too many. Um, but it'll be a number of sentences in most cases. And what it does is it will provide details that develop, that support, that explain what it is you're trying to say. How do you go about writing it? Well, think about what are the facts? What are the examples? What is the reasoning that leads to the conclusion that you want to conclude in this paragraph? Okay? Think about those things and then write them as sentences. So topic sentence, 
and then multiple sentences which provide support. Then you come to what's usually the last sentence of your paragraph, the concluding sentence. So what goes in a concluding sentence? Well, the conclusion. Where does it go? Well, it's a conclusion. It goes at the end. So probably no real surprise here. Um, in most cases, it'll be the last sentence of the paragraph. And what will it do? It can do a number of different things, but most commonly, it will summarize the information that you just presented. So it pulls it all together. It may very well also draw a conclusion from that information. So you gave some facts, you gave some reasoning. What's the conclusion? Well, when you write that down, that's your concluding sentence. So typically, it's a summary or a conclusion based on those supporting information in the area specified by the topic sentence. So a concluding sentence is actually kind of similar to a topic sentence, but it's a conclusion and drawn based upon the facts and information and reasoning and examples that you gave in the paragraph, in the body. So what you're trying to do with your concluding sentence is to let your reader know the relevance of whatever it is, whatever your conclusion is. Let them know the conclusion, let them know why it's important, if that's something you need to do. Um, so think about what are you trying to say with this paragraph, summarize it or conclude it in your concluding sentence. Okay, let's take a look at an example, an example paragraph. This one is titled, My Hometown. It's not actually about my personal hometown, but it's a nice little paragraph. My hometown is famous for several amazing natural features. First, it is noted for the Olaf River, which is very wide and beautiful. Also, on the other side of the town is Olaf Hill, which is unusual because it is very steep. The third amazing feature is the big old tree. This tree stands 200 feet tall and is probably about 600 years old. These three landmarks are truly amazing and make my hometown a famous place. Now, as you heard or read this paragraph, do you see the parts? Do you see the topic sentence? Do you see the supporting information? Do you see the conclusion? Do you see the structure? This is what you want to be doing. If you haven't seen it, take a look a little bit closer. We have a topic sentence. My hometown is famous for several amazing natural features. One topic, not two topics, not three topics, one topic. Orient the reader. What are the natural features? Topic sentence doesn't say because it's just orienting the reader. It's not giving the details. It's not giving the support. It's just orienting the reader. You give your support with the supporting sentences. In this particular case, we have three supporting sentences. So the wide and beautiful river, the unusually steep hill, and the old tall tree. So we have three sentences there providing supportive information in the direction that was created by the topic sentence. Then is there a conclusion? Yes, there is. These three landmarks, okay, so reasoning is being provided, a conclusion is being provided. These three landmarks are truly amazing and make my hometown a famous place. So you orient the reader, you give support, and then you draw the conclusion. This is a well-designed paragraph. Let's take a look at another example. This one titled, My Canada. There are three reasons why Canada is one of the best countries in the world. First, it has an excellent health care system. All Canadians have access to medical services at a reasonable price. Second, Canada has a high standard of education. Students are taught by well-trained teachers and are encouraged to continue studying at a university. Finally, the cities are clean and efficiently managed. They have many parks and lots of space for people to live. As a result, Canada is a desirable place to live. Hopefully you're now seeing the structure. If this was just something in an essay that you were reading, you might not be thinking analytically about the structure of the paragraphs. But during this video, hopefully you're now noticing the structure. There's a topic sentence. There are three reasons why Canada is one of the best countries in the world. So the reader knows, oh, okay, I'm probably going to be told three things, and they're probably about why Canada is a wonderful place. 
then we have the supporting sentences. In this case, we have six supporting sentences, three supporting ideas, each with two sentences, one that states what it is, so for example, it has an excellent healthcare system, and then another sentence that explains that all Canadians have access to medical services at a reasonable price. Remember, the goal is that your reader, when they get to your conclusion, will at least understand why you believe what you wrote, but very possibly agree with you. If you just wrote, it has an excellent healthcare system, the reader might wonder, oh, why? What's so good about it? You need to give information. The goal of writing is to transmit information. So here we have three ideas, three supporting ideas, done with six sentences. Okay, and then, not surprisingly, there's a concluding sentence. As a result, so based upon what was just written, as a result, Canada is a desirable place to live. So anybody who reads this paragraph will probably at least understand what the reader believes and why they believe it. And they might also think, yeah, that's probably true. So orient the reader with a topic sentence, give support, and then draw a logical conclusion. So, effective paragraphs, as I've said, topic sentence, supporting sentences, conclusion. That's the way you want to go. But there's a number of things you want to think about as well as you do this structure. One of them is called unity. Okay, I've already mentioned this in a different way. You want to focus on one thing and one thing only. So if you need to talk about three different things, that's fine, but that's three different paragraphs. Okay, so figure out, even if it's going to be only a five-sentence paragraph, which is kind of a short for a paragraph, but you're going to have three of them, that's fine. It's not a problem in most situations. Usually you don't have the problem of it needs to be shorter. That can come up. You know, sometimes you're given a limit, write an essay with um, a maximum of a certain number of words. Um, but generally speaking, more paragraphs is usually not a problem if it clearly presents the information. So one paragraph, one idea. Coherence is the, uh, another aspect of good paragraphs. So basically this is you've presented things in a logical way so that your reader will agree with you or at least understand why you believe what you believe. So you need to give them all the information they need in the order in which they need, need it in order to understand it. Okay? And very importantly, sufficient development. If you're gonna assert that Canada's a great place to live, you better give more than one example of a reason. You know, one example is not going to convince very many people. So think about development, whatever your idea is. What's the information the reader needs to know to really agree with you and understand your conclusion? So sufficiently develop your topic. Give examples, give facts, provide measurements, provide, explain the reasoning that you're actually using. These types of things all go in there in the support section of the paragraph, in the middle of the paragraph. Develop it sufficiently so that your conclusion makes sense to your reader. Now, let me turn to another detail, sort of a boring detail, but it's nevertheless an important one, and that is formatting. Now, almost everything I've said up to this point applies to all languages. So if you're writing in Japanese, everything I just said applies. <laughs> if you're writing in English, it applies. If you're writing for science or not for science, doesn't matter, it applies. Um, but when it comes to formatting, there are differences between different languages. And even within a language, things might be different in certain situations. So for example, you probably don't write the same way in an email as you do in an essay for school. So you need to think about these things. So let me talk a little bit about paragraph formatting. Um, in the case of English, English paragraphs should be indented by 1.27 centimeters unless you're told otherwise. This is standard pretty much across all English-speaking countries and has been the case, I don't really know, but probably for more than 100 years. Um, the 1.27, you might think, oh, that's a very, very weird number. Um, this is one half inch. So this was pre-metric, um, and for non-metric countries, it's a half of an inch. Um, so 1.27 is considered ideal for when you're writing in English. Um, if you're, of course, instructed otherwise, you'll sometimes notice me put, say this in a video or in a talk. Obviously, if you've been given instructions on how to do something, you should follow those instructions, okay? But when you don't know, and you're writing in English, 
first line of a paragraph indented by 1.27 centimeters. Now, how do you do that? Well, because this is so common, almost all word processors, when you install them in a computer, they are set so that the first tab point, so if you hit the tab key, the cursor jumps forward a bit. Where does it jump to? Almost all word processors are set to 1.27 centimeters for those tab stops. So what most people do is you open up your, doc your blank document, hit the tab key, and then start typing your paragraph. When you get to the end of your paragraph, you hit return, hit the tab key for your, to start your next paragraph, and you end up with 1.27 centimeters. You can also use special formatting options in your word processor to do this for you. Um, I prefer the tab method, but some people prefer having the word processor do it. Either is fine, but whichever you do, I strongly urge you, do that the same throughout your document. Be consistent, because if you use tabs for part of your report and you use paragraph formatting options for the other part of your report, they might not align quite perfectly, and that inconsistency will drive some readers crazy. And if it's going to a professor who's giving you a grade, you do not want to drive them crazy when they're grading your paper. So um, do think about what you're going to do, tabs, or using paragraph formatting. Now, regarding the case of indenting, the indentation of that first line tells the reader, new paragraph. That's what it means. That's what the formatting means. So you don't need to do anything else. Specifically, you should not put a blank line in between your paragraphs. So if you're indenting your paragraph, you do not put a blank line. Now, if you're writing email, lots of email programs don't have tabs, or tabs look funny when you use them. So an email will often use no tabs and will put a blank line. But that's not a formal type of writing. In all formal writing in English, you should probably be tabbing the first line of the paragraph and have no blank lines in between the paragraphs. So as I said, Email, probably an exception for most people. Okay. Um, now, another thing to think about is the justification. Justification refers to how the words are arranged or stretched out so that the margins, so that the edges, the right-hand vertical edge, the left-hand vertical edge, are they straight or are they jagged? So what you're looking at right now, this bottom pair, this bottom sentence here, is what's called fully justified. So in full justification, you have a straight left edge and you have a straight right edge. Many people think, oh, that looks so professional. It looks like a newspaper or a magazine or a book, and they want to do this. But in fact, in almost all English writing, you are not supposed to do this. This is only done by the publishers themselves. So for example, I as a scientist, if I write a manuscript that I want to publish as an article, when I send it to the publisher, it looks like it now does here, left justified. So straight, vertical, left-hand edge, but the right edge, jagged, called left justification. Everything is up against the left. You should always use left justification unless there's a really good reason not to. So for example, if your professor really likes fully justified, that's a good reason to use it in that class. But in general, use left justification. Okay. This is also important for proofreading because if you use full justification, you won't be able to tell if you have extra spaces in between words or if your word processor has temporarily inserted spaces in order to create that full justification effect. So you cannot actually proofread a document well that's fully justified. But in any case, you probably should be using left justification anyway. Okay, a few notes about clarity, brevity, so being short, being concise, precision, and being objective. Okay, so in scientific writing, generally it's true as well, but specifically for scientific writing, you want to write as clearly and as simply as possible. Okay, so do not add extra stuff if it does not help your reader. Now, if it helps your reader, then you should use it. Okay, but don't put in other things just because you could. So you measured something in, in your experiments, but the reader probably won't care. Don't put it in because you feel like, but I measured it, I want to put it in my report. If the reader's not going to care, don't put it in. So include the things that they would expect, include the things they need. Also, be as precise, as accurate, as focused as possible. Okay? That helps people really understand your reasoning 
and why you believe what you believe, why you drew the conclusion that you drew. Very important for science, not important in many other areas of writing, but for scientific writing, you need to be objective. Okay, so basically no emotion. You don't get to express how happy or how sad you are about the results of your experiments or your research. You also definitely should not exaggerate that you know, you've solved this huge problem, unless of course you really did solve some huge problem. So some people might be really excited about their research and they might write something like, this experiment conclusively shows that. Well, you know, did it really? Did it really conclusively show something? Probably not. Even research by Nobel laureates usually does not prove anything. It supports, but it usually does not prove. So probably you should write something along the lines of, taken as a whole, these findings suggest such and such. Okay, um, or maybe perhaps these results support the idea that, boom, boom, boom. The conclusively shows, proves, proven, these words a little bit too strong or maybe a lot too strong for most cases. So think objectively. What did you really find? What did you really show? Be emotionally neutral about it, whether you're happy or sad about it inside. In your writing, be as neutral as possible. Okay, let's take a look at a perfect paragraph. Okay, what would a perfect paragraph be? A perfect paragraph would have a topic sentence that states clearly, without examples, what it is the paragraph is about. Okay, it orients the reader. Then all the sentences in between the first and the last provide the findings, the analyses, the examples, whatever it is, the supporting information. And then the last sentence, as has been mentioned, would draw the conclusion or summarize the information from the paragraph. One possibility is it might also act as a transition into the next paragraph, but usually a conclusion or summary. As far as the length, how long should a paragraph be? Generally, it should be more than one sentence long. One sentence paragraphs, when people read them, they think, oh, this was written by or written for junior high school students, keeping it really, really easy. So it's, it's a bad idea to have one sentence paragraphs. I myself have probably written a few in my life, but basically you do not want to write one sentence paragraphs. As far as what's too long, what's too big, there's no specific rule, but you probably do not want to have very many paragraphs that have more than 300 words. That's approximately an A4 page um, with double spacing. So if you have a single paragraph and it's covering more than an entire page of double spaced page, then it's probably too long. Not necessarily, but probably. So take a look at it and think, can you break it down into two subtopics or three subtopics? So in terms of the length, how long should a paragraph be? Definitely more than one sentence, but probably not more than about 300 or maybe 350 words. So those are some of the ideas, some of the thoughts that I want to share with you in this video on paragraph writing on the structure of a scientific report. Um, I hope you find this helpful and I hope you find the videos, the other videos in this series to also be helpful for your writing. So write well.